Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to um, be thinking about the book The Abolition of Sex by Kara Dansky, which was published in 2021. And we have Leah Keith and Kara Dansky who are going to be talking about the book. So um, over to you, Leah and Kara. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's early here, maybe not so early where you are. I'm really excited to be talking about this book because I think this was one of the best things that happened uh, in the last year was the publication of The Abolition of Sex. And I say that because in the United States anyway, we have had a terrible, terrible time breaking through into any kind of mainstream coverage of this issue. So having a book that actually walks people through it really step by step has been incredibly helpful um, because the media just isn't going to do this not yet we've had right-wing coverage there's conservatives that will talk about this but the kind of main the absolute the centrist stuff and then the lefty stuff we get nothing so it's just been amazing to have a book to give people that is this clear so the book does not disappoint i was looking forward to it and then I was so excited when I actually had it in my hands because it was everything that we needed in this movement right now, just step by step walking everybody through. What is gender identity? Why is it a problem for women? What has already happened to women because of this legal concept and what we might do about it? So I love this book and I've given out, I don't even know how many copies of it to the point where I don't even have one right now. <laughs> it's not on my shelf. I don't know who has it. So um, anyway, it's a great book and I, um, just super pumped about it. Um, Kara, do you want to talk now and do your slides or do you want me to keep going? Thanks so much, Joe and WDI and thanks, Lier. I'll read a bit from it. Um, Joe, do you want to put the slides up? Do you want me to? Yeah, I, I can put them. So I've put one now just just because I did. <laughs> but um, I'll, yeah, you tell me when you want them and um, I'll take it down now, but then whenever you want them, no, or do you want it up now? Yeah, it's great. It's great. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Let me check that I can. There we are. Okay. All right. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'll talk a, a, a bit and read from the book, but I thought I would also say a little bit about how the book came to be. And then I'll read a few sections from the beginning and from the introductory chapter, and then we can have a discussion. So I've been talking about the threats that so-called gender identity poses to the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls for several years. In 2015, I joined the US-based organization Women's Liberation Front, which Lear founded. And I went on to serve on the board of Women's Liberation Front between 2016 and 2020. In that capacity, I did my best to talk in the US media about the seriousness of the situation. In the US, as Lier said, like in the UK, it's nearly impossible to have an honest conversation about the threats that gender identity poses to women and girls. The only media outlets that will even touch on the topic are typically considered to be conservative, and I'm not politically conservative. So the entire situation is very difficult to manage. After one of my media appearances in early 2021, a publisher reached out to me via LinkedIn. Now I have to say, it's somewhat extraordinary that I was able to connect with this publisher because I never checked my LinkedIn account. But one day I did, and there was a message from him. We talked on the phone and he told me that he wanted to get the word out to mainstream liberal Americans. And he thought that I was the right person to do that. Mainstream American liberals aren't the only audience for this book. There are plenty of people, there's plenty in the book for people outside the US and for people who don't consider themselves to be liberal. But the target audience for this book is American liberals who do not understand the topic. The publisher and I talked several times in order to iron out the content and format of the book and we had a signed contract by May of 2021, requiring me to complete the first draft by August 1st of 2021. I did that 
and the book was published in November. The whole thing happened very quickly. My hope is that the book is doing the work that it was primarily meant to do. Educate mainstream American liberals about the harms done and the threats posed by gender identity. I am grateful for the opportunity to read some portions of it here for radical feminist perspectives. So the beginning, the book is dedicated to quote, the parents who watch in silent agony while a vicious industry works relentlessly to annihilate their children's bodies and lives. It continues, sex, the differentiation between male and female determined by whether an X bearing sperm or a Y bearing sperm fertilized the X bearing ovum, which determines the type of sexual and reproductive organs that develop and the biological differences between females and males. The next short bit, which is something of a preface, is quoted from a British woman posting in the online forum Mumsnet in 2020. It's meant to be read as though it were written in the future. Looking back on this point in time today, and it's so prescient and poignant, quote, they literally stopped recognizing every actual single woman and girl, every female person. And they told us that we were now all an identity instead of a sex, a psychology instead of a physiology. That was what female now meant. So that men could say they were women and they did. Hundreds of thousands of them did. There was no single word for actual females. We weren't allowed one. Our word was reallocated to men. We had to talk about ourselves as people with cervixes or menstruators. And we had to agree that biology wasn't the real difference between the sexes, identity was. One by one, Every reference to biological sex was replaced in every law with references to identity until the law had erased any connection with female biology from pregnancy, childbirth, motherhood. Everything became something that applied to both men and women because it was forbidden to have real references to sex. Stating that only females were women was enough to lose your job or even be charged with a crime. Failing to agree with a man that he was a woman was enough to be ostracized, censored, or threatened with legal action. Men took over women's sports, institutions, groups. Men represented us in every level of society, calling themselves women. There were no words to distinguish ourselves from these men. Everyone could see the female sex were becoming unspeakable people, unspoken of. You weren't allowed to acknowledge our separate existence from male people. Men committed crimes and society said women did it. You could never escape a man because he could follow you into any public space by identifying as female. People were very, very afraid to tell the truth. Many hundreds of children lost their reproductive organs trying to become the other sex. It was a very dark time. Introduction, the transgender delusion, observations of a turf. In March of 2021, a person named Rachel Levine was confirmed as the Assistant Secretary for Health at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Levine is a biological male who claims to be a transgender woman. 
During the confirmation hearings in February 2021, every single member of the United States Senate was expected to pretend that Levine is a woman. Every single member did so. No one was permitted to question this, and no one even tried. Under questioning from Senator Rand Paul, Levine refused to state whether or not he approved of administering life-altering and potentially sterilizing and lethal drugs to physically healthy teenagers. On October 19th, 2021, the Department of Health and Human Services announced that Levine had been sworn in as, quote, the first female four-star admiral of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. On the same day, the New York Times said the same thing on Twitter. The United States government and the New York Times outright lied to everyone by saying that Levine is female. On September 18th, 2021, the one year anniversary of the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, tweeted a quote about abortion rights from Justice Ginsburg's 1993 Supreme Court confirmation hearing, editing out all of the words that identified abortion as a right that pertains exclusively to women, i.e. female humans, the only humans who are capable of getting pregnant. Full disclosure, I worked at the ACLU from 2012 to 2014. Justice Ginsburg's original statement read, quote, the decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. It is a decision she must make for herself. When government controls that decision for her, she is being treated less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choices. The version that the ACLU tweeted read, quote, the decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a person's life, to their well-being and dignity. When the government controls that decision for people, they are being treated less than a fully adult responsible for their own choices. It is difficult to imagine a graver insult to one of the most prominent women's rights advocates in the history of the United States of America and the founder of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project than to edit women completely out of one of her most famous quotes on the anniversary of her death. The ACLU's executive director later acknowledged that this was an error but he stated that it was, quote, not an error without a thought, and then went on to state that there are people who are pregnant and who seek abortions who do not identify as women. This is no doubt true, but it is also beside the point. There is no such thing as a pregnant person who is not either a woman or a girl, and there never has been. This is, of course, precisely why conservatives work so hard to keep women from having abortions. Later the same month, The Lancet, arguably the most reputable medical journal in the world, tweeted an image of the cover of its next issue. The cover stated, our new issue is here. On the cover, periods on display, and the cultural movement against menstrual shame and period poverty, plus WHO air quality guidelines, low back pain management, community acquired bacterial meningitis and more. Read. The cover of the issue stated simply, quote, historically, the anatomy and physiology of bodies with vaginas have been neglected. And with that, The Lancet reduced women to bodies with vaginas. 
The editor later apologized. And in his apology, he added, quote, I want to emphasize that transgender health is an important dimension of modern healthcare, but one that remains neglected. I'm gonna skip this quote, blah, blah, blah. He goes on about transgender health. But the point is this, he didn't explain why going into depth about the health needs of so-called trans people or even define the phrase trans people in his statement, apologizing for referring to women as bodies with vaginas. Why? One may reasonably ask if some men have vaginas and need abortions, why all of this backpedaling? In late September 2021, the UK Labour Party met for its annual conference. When asked by a news reporter, quote, is it transphobic to say that only women have a cervix, Labour leader Keir Starmer said, it is something that should not be said. Doubling down, Labour member David Lammy later said that the statement, only women have a cervix, may not be transphobic, but it's not accurate. His reasoning was that while it's probably the case that trans women don't have ovaries, but a cervix, I understand, is something you can have following various procedures. One may reasonably wonder whether these men have any idea at all what a cervix is. Notably, the statement, trans women can have a cervix, in response to the question, is it transphobic? to say that only women have a cervix is an implicit acknowledgement that the category of people being referred to as trans women are in fact not women at all. The category of people being referred to as trans women are in fact men and everyone knows it. Thus in September, 2021, all of this set off a firestorm in UK media and on social media about what a woman is the US media paid little to no attention to the controversy at all. Awareness of this problem has been building for some time, but only recently has it begun to engender resistance. The breakthrough issue in terms of public opinion have involved the invasion of female spaces by men claiming to be women, particularly women's sports and other female only spaces like public bathrooms and changing rooms. All over the world, men are competing in women's sports on the pretext that they are trans women, which is taken to mean some special type of women. For example, a man named Laurel Hubbard was permitted to compete in the women's weightlifting category in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics on the basis that he is a so-called trans woman, i.e. a man who pretends to be a woman. This is said to be true because he has a so-called female gender identity. The International Olympic Committee and the global media expected everyone to accept these assertions as true. Most people appeared to play along with the charade. Male convicted rapists are being permitted to be housed in women's prisons with vulnerable women, many of whom have already suffered tremendous abuse at the hands of men. A man who goes by the name of Princess Zoe Marie Andromeda Love, who was convicted of raping a 12 year old girl is being housed in a Washington state women's prison and has allegedly had sexual intercourse with a female inmate, which if true, legally constitutes rape. His placement in the women's prison is in accordance with the official policy of the Washington State Department of Corrections. I wanna pause here and say my understanding is that Mr. Princess Zoe Marie Andromeda Love, I believe has since been released and is now identifying as a man again on the outside. It's my understanding, Lear will correct me if I'm wrong. In July of 2021, a man was permitted to enter a women's section of a nude spa in Los Angeles and to expose himself and his erect penis to naked girls. The reason this was allowed to happen is that California law prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in public accommodations, but it also defines sex to include gender identity and gender expression, 
completely ignoring the material reality of biological sex. All of this is accomplished via the claim that men can be some form of women, i.e. trans women. Anyone who questions this is immediately labeled transphobic. Discussion is not permitted. This assault on women's rights is not occurring in a vacuum or by accident. It is being perpetrated by a vicious and brutal industry that operates openly and yet manages to sneak under the public radar. Its aim is to abolish sex in the law and throughout society. We are all victims of this assault, but those most harmed are women and girls, i.e. female human beings. Our society has simply not grappled with the implications of enshrining words like transgender and gender identity in law, policy, business, academia, and media. We need to start grappling with this. The time to do that is now. The media will not speak candidly about this and any woman or man for that matter who attempts to speak the truth is immediately labeled a turf or trans exclusionary radical feminist. This kind of labeling is extremely dishonest and misleading, but it has also been remarkably effective putting feminists on the defensive as though defending our existence as female is somehow harmful. Here's the truth we cannot speak. Can we have the next slide? Joe? Um, yes, it's coming up. It will take a second, but it's, I'll bring it. Okay. Yeah, the one after that? Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, I missed that one. The next one. Okay, here's the truth we cannot speak. Gender identity does not exist in any real material sense. And transgender is simply a made up concept that is used to justify all kinds of atrocities. It is in effect, a men's rights movement intended to objectify women's bodies and erase us as a class. It is left-wing misogyny on steroids. I say this as a leftist and a Democrat. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, famed author JK Rowling recently said that we are living in one of the most misogynistic times in recent history. She's right. From a feminist perspective, men as a class have always dominated women and trampled on our rights. And today is no different, except that it's worse because it's being done under the ruses of transgenderism and gender identity, both of which are being enshrined in law at all levels of government and pushed by the political left. Many of us women on the political left are accustomed to having our rights trampled on by the right. We are not used to experiencing it from within our own political ranks. I care about this issue for two reasons. First, as a feminist, I care about the rights, privacy and safety of women and girls and allowing men and boys to invade female only spaces is dangerous and profoundly misogynistic. Second, as a human being, I want public policy to be grounded in material reality and science. Enshrining vague concepts like transgender and gender identity in law and policy threatens both of those interests. Now I'm skipping a few paragraphs about my personal and political history, including my work at WDI and Women's Liberation Front. And so I'll go forward. My involvement in Wolf and what was then called WHRC, now WDI, meant that I was a TERF, i.e. a feminist who cares about the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls. That meant that I was no longer permitted to associate in so-called 
progressive circles or work in the so-called progressive criminal justice reform movement. Instead, I'm labeled a TERF. J.K. Rowling, Canadian journalist Megan Murphy, and the UK-based member of parliament, Rosie Duffield, a member of the left-wing Labour Party, have all been labeled TERFs for their public statements. Rowling's offense was saying that men should not be fired saying that women should not be fired for saying that sex is real. Murphy refer, referred to a man as him. Duffield said that only women have a cervix. In October, 2021, Netflix released a Dave Chappelle comedy special called The Closer, in which he offered support to JK Rowling before announcing that he is team turf. He made taboo breaking jokes about the issue and boldly mocked the pretense that a man can become a woman or vice versa, simply by declaring it so. This set off a firestorm of debate about whether Dave Chappelle was transphobic, including predictably angry demands from a small group of very vocal activists for Netflix to pull his extremely popular special offline. So far, the network has refused. Commentator Bill Maher, a staunch defender of free speech, would later declare on television that he is Team Dave and called for a, quote, honest, free discussion about this. Many feminists have chosen to reclaim the term TERF, saying that it stands for tired of explaining real facts or totally exceptional radical feminist or tirelessly explaining reality to fools. Nonetheless, the acronym continues to be used to smear feminists who insist on fighting for rights for women and girls. On September 8th, 2021, famed gay leftist George Takai tweeted, quote, quite right, TERFs are like the anti-vaxxers of the left, resistant to science and reason, convinced of their wrong position, and a real danger to others. But what is dangerous, wrong, or resistant to science and reason about saying that women have rights as women? Whether or not to re refer to oneself as a turf as, is a difficult and personal decision. Joe, can you go to the next slide? I'm not sure if we're there. Okay, we'll get there. Yeah, we're, we're, that's next, great. Whether or not to refer to oneself as a TERF is a difficult and personal decision. I will not label anyone a TERF because of the words negative connotations. For myself, having been called a TERF more times than I can count, I say this. If caring about the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls, if caring that law and policy are grounded in science and reality makes me a turf, so be it. Feminists have a saying, we can't fight sexism if we can't say what sex is. And that is precisely where we are as a society today. We can't say what sex is. We're abolishing sex and replacing it with gender identity or transgenderism. Readers can be forgiven for not knowing much about this. No one ever reads about the abolition of sex in the media because most mainstream media outlets are actively engaged in a concerted effort to conceal it. Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube all deplatform critics of transgenderism. Amazon has said publicly that it will not sell books that criticize it. Side note. Amazon still has my book on its website. But the abolition of sex is real and it is dangerous. This book is an effort to uncover and explore its origins, the reasons it is happening and its impacts on women and girls. My aims are twofold. One, to persuade readers that while sex is real, transgender is not and therefore has no basis for being enshrined in the law. And two, to persuade readers that to the extent our society 
seems to have accepted the lie that transgender is real, its main victims are women and girls because the agenda is to obliterate sex. If we cannot talk about the material reality of sex, we cannot fight for the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls as a sex class. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Feminists worked hard to ensure the creation of female-only spaces, such as public bathrooms, sports teams, and domestic violence shelters. Before that, suffragists, suffragettes, if you like, secured the right of women to vote. Today, we have scholarships, business loans, and other civic institutions that are intended exclusively for women and girls because women have historically been discriminated against on the basis of sex. The transgender agenda threatens all of these important historical gains and undermines feminists' ability to fight for future goals by insisting that women do not exist as a class of people. Then I go into a feminist analysis of gender, the feminist effort to abolish gender, and the irony of now abolishing sex instead. Okay, so now we're getting to the end of the introductory chapter. This book is primarily about the aspect of transgender, the, the transgender agenda that involves men claiming to be women. It is not about the aspect of the transgender agenda that involves women claiming to be men, so-called detransitioners or people of either sex who go through hormonal and or surgical transition and then revert back. Differences of sexual development, commonly referred to as intersex. Trans widows, the women whose husbands transition late in life and typically abandon them and their children. Or the heartbreaking phenomenon of medically transitioning children. Those are all extremely important topics that deserve separate attention. Author Abigail Schreier tackles the agonizing problem of the medical transitioning of teenage girls in her 2020 book, Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. This book is also not about the relatively new phenomenon of people claiming to be non-binary. I mentioned non-binary here only because, and I'm writing this in 2020 and 2021, now, of course, non-binary is totally mainstream. But anyway, um, I mentioned non-binary here only because it is an aspect of this discussion that is playing out in society and it cannot be omitted. In April, 2016, actor and singer Amanda Stenberg said that she identifies as non-binary. Actor Sam Smith did the same in March, 2019. Then came actor Brigitte Lundy Payne in November, 2019. There was a series of additional coming out as non-binary stories. And then Ellen slash Elliot Page made the same announcement in 2020. What these celebrities appear to be saying is that they are neither male nor female. Readers who think that this does not make any sense are correct. All human beings adopt some characteristics and personality traits that are typically considered to be either masculine or feminine. This does not change a person's sex. All human beings, like all mammals, are either female or male, every single one of us. The only additional thing that might helpfully be said about the phenomenon of people identifying as non-binary at this time is that it is not accurate to suggest that male and female are identity categories. They are not. They are biologically based sex categories that appear in five of the seven kingdoms of life. Thank you, Lier, who sent me that information while I was doing my research for the book. Suggesting that female is an identity category is also insulting to feminists who have fought for decades to secure rights for women and girls. 
woman is not a category that anyone can identify into or out of. Uh, next slide. If possible, no. Okay, okay, well, that's the end. Never mind then. Okay, cool. Many people, conservatives especially, like to argue that feminists are responsible for the abolition of sex by accusing us of making the claim that men and women are identical. But this is not true. Feminists have been fighting the concept of gender for decades. No feminist that I am aware of has ever said that women do not exist as a coherent biological and legal category. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Feminists know exactly what the category women means. The ultimate aim of feminism is to liberate women and girls from the cages that imprison us. That the category women and girls does not exist is a central claim of the gender identity industry, not of feminists. Okay, at this point, readers might be thinking, okay, but I have a child or sister, brother, niece, nephew, cousin, friend, et cetera, who is trans. What should I do about that? Just ignore his or her identity? My answer is this. Your child, sister, brother, niece, nephew, cousin, friend, or whomever is still either female or male, even if the person has adopted a so-called trans identity. That's what matters. That's what is true in a material, real, objective sense. The person in question can adopt a subjective gender identity if she or he wants to, but that identity is no more real than it would be for you or me or anyone else to identify as a tree or a chair. I know these issues are difficult to think and talk about. I know that many of us have loved ones who are caught up in the delusion, and yes, it is a delusion, that there is a coherent category of people called trans. I have loved ones who are caught up in this cultural fad. Many people struggle with painful confusion as to whether they are really the opposite sex. Many conclude that they are in fact the opposite sex and go on to have all kinds of surgeries and take all sorts of hormones to validate that fantasy. Then they insist on having everyone else in our society act as though that's perfectly normal. If you ask me, the best thing we can do for these people is to be kind to them by telling the truth. We can help our children sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews, cousins, and friends to love and accept themselves as they are. Girls, boys, women, and men. Everything else is a lie. I'm often told that I ought to be kind and compassionate and let people live their best lives as they choose. Fair enough but I don't think that validating a person's delusion counts as kindness. Then I go into a story about how I was anorexic when I was 18 and went off to college, which is totally true. And my parents helped me by getting me the help that I needed to get me out of my delusion about my body. And then we get to the conclusion. In 2014, a friend opened my eyes to the problems that the transgender agenda presents to women and girls in terms of rights, privacy, and safety by telling me that transgender is anti-feminist because it is, in her words, the ultimate penetration of our bodies by men. Along the way, I have met numerous parents whose children, both minors and young adults, were struggling with matters of sex and gender. Many of these children appeared to believe that they were, quote, born in the wrong body and that they were, in fact, the opposite sex. Some simply wanted to escape their biological sex in search of something different. 
Today, such a phenomenon might seem healthy and normal. It is not. The parents I have met with trans children are in agony. The gender identity industry is feeding their children drugs that will result in permanent sterilization and possible terminal illness. It is subjecting them to surgeries that mutilate, amputate, and destroy healthy body parts. Most of these, most of these parents are unable to speak out because they have very legitimate concerns about their relationships with their children and about their children's privacy. So they sit and wait and hope while their children's lives and bodies are being destroyed. This book is for them. So that ends the introduction. Chapter one of the book is called, What is a Woman? And explores the knots that people often tie themselves into by denying that the category women, women exists. Chapter two, the legal abolition of sex discusses some statutory and legal developments in the US. Chapter three is implications for women and girls of abolishing sex and includes the, uh, discusses the inclusion of men in women's sports, the housing of men in women's prisons, the invasion of men into women only spaces like bathrooms and locker rooms and the like. Chapter four is the abolition of sex in media in discourse, which discusses the media blackout and the difficulties of discussing all of this in social media. Chapter five is the gender identity industry, which discusses a loose conglomeration of companies, nonprofits, media outlets, and law firms, all of which profit from the abolition of sex, including the sexual objectification of women and girls. The book concludes with a chapter about what can be done about all of this, including the work of Women's Declaration International to advance the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights Throughout Law and Society. Thank you so much, and I'm very happy to have a discussion. Yay. Well, that is a very complete rundown of this amazing work that you've done. Um, so I do have some discussion points. And the first one I think is the most, maybe the most key. Um, you have this great quote on page 10. The truth is there's no such thing as quote unquote transgender. And then you talk about how, you know, you put the word in quotes because it's not real. You know, it's not true in any, in any material sense. So this is my dog who has a cone on. So that's what, <laughs> poor Jamie. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, I mean, I feel the same, right? That this is, it's just obvious to me that this is not real, right? That this is just a made up thing. Um, but a lot of women who come to this, you know, it takes a while for them to understand that this is not real. And so you find these people who have, you know, they still believe in like true trans, we call it, that they still think that there are these people who, uh, you know, and it, it seems to revolve around, oh, they have this thing called gender dysphoria. So we're gonna call those the true trans. And these are some of the people on our side who, I, you know, I don't want to just dismiss them because they do often an incredible amount of work. They've risked a lot. They've lost their careers. And yet they still abide by this concept that there really is a thing called transgender. Um, and I'm wondering, did you ever feel that? Did you ever think that that was a true thing, that there was somebody who was truly trans? And how did you get from here to there? Because when I think about you like your tagline in my head is always men are male <laughs> women are female everything else is a lie and i love that level of clarity so i'm just wondering how you got from here to there yeah i i don't think there was a here to there but it's a good question because the book publisher when when i was i was talking on the phone with him one time and he was talking about some other books that have been written on the topic and he said, you're saying something that no one else has said yet, which is that trans is just not a thing. Transgender is a lie. It's not real. And I was like, oh, I guess I am saying that. But it's always kind of been clear. The moment I peaked trans in 2014, it was obvious to me that trans isn't real. Like, it's just not real. It just isn't. So, like, let's talk about it like that. Like, it's not real. When I joined your organization there in 2015, I knew that trans wasn't real. And that's why I joined it. So 
So no, there was no difficulty getting from here to there. And, and I just, for anyone watching either live or on the recording, it's so liberating to just get from here to there. If anyone watching is still stuck in like some people are trans, like it's just, it's a lot easier once you just get rid of it. It really is. Why do you think so many of them are still like true trans believers? I just can't figure it out because they're not stupid people and they clearly get how dangerous this is for women. You know, like I said, some of them really have dedicated years at this point and lost an awful lot along the way. And yet there's still this, I don't know what it is, this stumbling block that somehow there are these people who are, oh, the poor true trans, not only are they oppressed, but their movement's been taken over by these crazy activists. Like, so they really wanna you know, make these two different categories. And I just can't figure out why. Why are they still clinging to this? I mean, men. I guess, you know, central men. Yeah, maybe it's just that simple. Well, uh, so then you go on to talk about the abolition of gender and that um, abolishing the concept of sex was never a feminist goal. Um, and then there's all these men, especially conservative men, but I do see this on the liberal side as well, who like to say, well, y'all got what you deserved. You wanted to say that we were all the same and now, ha ha, this is where we are. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that because I, I get a little bit tired of that sort of, you know, this sort of sneering from, from men saying that they, I mean, they don't understand what feminism was really about but they wanna blame us for this movement. So how do you address that? Yeah, so this I find to be a tricky one. I mean, ultimately I understand that second wave feminists we're not fighting for um, we're, we're not fighting for the notion that there literally are no differences between the biological sexes. I mean, feminists clearly understood that that women are female, right? Like feminists clearly understood what the category women means. But I do see some things in second wave feminism that that concern me a little bit. You know, like when I read Shulamith Firestone. Um, she makes some arguments that make me uncomfortable. And I think yeah. that there's some credence to the notion that uh, th th there were some arguments being made in the late 1960s and early 1970s that, that pointed us in this direction. However, I don't think that second wave feminists are responsible for where we got because they didn't have the institutional power to get us here. What got us here is postmodernism and queer theory and pedophilic right. men like Michel Foucault teaching at Berkeley. And, you know, so like feminists are not responsible for this. We've always known what the category women means and none of us have ever been interested in abolishing the, the notion that, that we're female. I mean, it's absurd. It's just absurd. But, you know, in social media, particularly, it's so easy for men to blame feminists for where we are. It's just so easy and lazy and stupid and convenient. You know, what, yeah, it's, what always it, all, it's always our fault. Whatever men do to us, it's always our fault. We always brought it on somehow. It's the first rule of misogyny. It's the first rule of misogyny. Whatever a man does is a woman's fault. But no, men created this. Pedophilic men created this monster. Yeah. Yeah, and that's sort of like the, there's a whole realm of this that most, most people, even a lot of radical feminists just don't want to look at, which is the whole fetish part of it. You know, I mean, Sheila Jeffries has certainly paved the way for a lot of us to understand that, but there's so much just horrible stuff out there. Um, and then there keep being these, you know, instances of it that pop into the media. And I'm thinking here about, you know, David Challoner in the, the UK as one prime example, but you know, you scratch the surface on these guys and it's just nothing but sexual violation and fetishes and often out and out abuse of real children, you know, like all the way down. Uh, that's just what there is. And a lot of people, they still want to believe somehow that, oh, they just want to live their lives. And it's like, those are the men I can't actually find, the ones who just want to live their lives. Um, these others are really what this movement is made out of. And it's just, 
there's still that, like, it's like this barrier that a lot of women just don't want to break to, to notice the true nature of this movement. It's, it's astonishing. And, you know, scratch the surface of Redux, right? Like yeah. Redux is just doing some absolutely phenomenal work in, in, in examining a lot of this stuff, but, but, you know, we, we are living in a hellscape where yeah. women and children are just relentlessly exploited, pornographied, abused, tortured, raped, and killed. And I, I guess, Lier, the only answer I have is that it's, it's just too hard. It's too hard for some of us to look at what is happening and to look at it directly and to acknowledge the reality. Um, you know, some, some voices that are, I think are not heard enough. I mentioned it briefly in my introduction in my book are so-called trans widows, right? right? Like, we don't hear from these women enough. The, the media ignores all of us. <laughs> the media ignores all of us um, annoyingly. Um, but, but that community of women are, are not heard at all. And I, I want to hear more from them because they are some of the most victimized, but it's hard. It's hard to hear, um, you know, she said it publicly, so I can say it here last August, uh, in Tacoma at the Sovereign Women Speak, when Beth Stelzer was speaking, she, Beth Stelzer speaks mostly about, the importance of women's sports, but she got right up there on the podium and she said that she left her ex-husband after she found him masturbating, wearing lingerie. Oh God. Well, good on her for getting out because it doesn't get better. Good on her for getting out. Um, it gets worse. Masturbating. Yeah. But no one's telling these women that, you know, it's like 1950s, what women told you know, what women were told about batterers. Oh, you can change them. Oh, it'll be fine. Oh, you'll learn to, you know, whatever. And it's all on you to manage this. Um, and they're being told the same thing about these horribly abusive, narcissistic men. This is never going to get better. The moment they've gone down that path, it's just further and further, you know, to the dark side, essentially, it just takes over their personalities. Like there's no way they, they don't ever seem to come back from it, you know, and you can't help him do this. He's just going to suck you dry. Um, and they're not being told that it's, oh, you have to support him. You have, it's just like nothing changed yeah. for these poor women. And I, yesterday I was listening to a, it doesn't matter what, but it was a podcast and it's these two, you know, more or less lefty guys. And they seem to be very good on various aspects of like, you know, woke, which is why I listen sometimes, but they're completely wrong about the trans issue, like as ever, you know, and their, their take home point was, oh, everyone's telling us we shouldn't use these why wouldn't I use pronouns for, you know, if somebody, it's just a respectful thing to do. If this trans woman wants to be called she, well, of course I would do that. And you can already see in the comments that people are like, you know, the moment you give them the pronouns, they take everything. You're agreeing with the ideology. You're agreeing with a thing that is simply not true. You might want to think this one over. You guys are pretty smart. And then their response to this is, um, well, the real problem is that you all out there who are criticizing us for this, you haven't met any quote trans people yet. And when you meet them, it will all change. And I just couldn't stop laughing. Like, you think we come to this out of ignorance? I haven't spent the last decade of my life being told to die in a grease fire, get sexually assaulted by, you know, name your object, uh, be tortured to death, murdered in various ways, like almost on a daily basis by these men. You think I don't know them. Okay. And then of course I immediately think about the trans widows. Like, no, those, these are the women who know these guys the most. And yeah. you don't even seem to under, like it, the gap there is just so enormous. So anyway, yeah, that's still where we are. I think with a lot of people, um, you use the Marilyn Fry birdcage uh, that that analogy that she has, you use that to great effect in the book. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just explain that to everybody, because I, that's one of the things from the, the politics of reality that is useful forever in one's life. So maybe you could just talk about that for a second. Yeah, so Marilyn Fry's The Politics of Reality, which Julia Beck and I talked about a few weeks ago on Radical Feminist Perspectives. Um, so, so this book and this concept is what woke me up 
uh, in my early 20s when I was in college. That's when I first read it. And my life changed um, forever when I read it. And she talks about a birdcage. And if you imagine a bird in a birdcage, and if all you can see is one wire in the birdcage, then it's inexplicable why the bird doesn't simply fly around the wire in order to escape. And if you look myopically at a few of the wires in the birdcage, it's still inexplicable. Why does the bird simply not fly away? There's only a few wires there. The bird can fly away, get around the wires, shouldn't be a problem. Why does the bird just sit there? It's only when you see the birdcage in its totality and you see all of the wires and how they work together to keep the bird in its cage, is it possible to understand why the bird simply cannot fly away? It is caught in the cage. And that is a visual representation in Marilyn Fry's uh, essay on oppression. And it, it absolutely changed my life. Now she's talking about male supremacy generally, She's not particularly talking about gender and she's certainly not talking about gender identity because she's writing about this in 1978 or 1979 or something. But I think it really fits uh, when we're talking about gender and gender identity. Uh, we, we, sort of, we, we sort of can't get out of it, um, but, but many of us do in various ways um, choose to not comply, um, but it's hard, it's hard. I hope more of us do it. I hope we break out. Well, we've got two minutes left. So what would you like to, what's your sort of your closing thoughts on your book? How's the book going by the way? Have you had, is your publisher happy with it? Are you happy with where it's gone? The publisher's happy with it. Um, I'm happy with it. It's been one year. It was published November 8th, 2021. Um, so it's been a year and a couple of weeks. I, I, I would say it, it's already almost outdated. When I read it now, things have changed so quickly in 2022. It, I mean, it, it, it feels out of date. It feels arcane a little bit. Like I, I would write it differently if I wrote it today. Uh, which is fine. I was writing it when I was writing it. But in January 2022, I kind of thought, okay, things are going to change radically this year. And they have, right? Like gender identity has just sped up. We've got, you know, Dylan Mulvaney meeting with the president of the United States. We've got Jordan Gray playing the piano with his penis on some stage somewhere. Like it's just mind bogglingly bizarre the directions that gender identity has gone. Um, we've got a latent public that still doesn't understand what's going on despite our best yeah. efforts yeah. because the media still won't talk will about not it. talk about it. I know. Will not talk about it, but uh, TERFs are on the ascendance. I do think we are getting more done. We are getting heard. We're getting out there. I'm hearing more and more from people behind the scenes. Kara, what the heck is going on here? I don't understand. This is crazy. I get emails and private messages on social media every day from mm -hmm. liberals who are frustrated. So I think the book is doing the work it was meant to do. And I hope it will continue to do that. Well, great. And those of you who don't have this book, you need to get this book. There has not been this level of clarity on the subject since Sheila Jeffries' book, Gender Hurts. This, it's the level that Kara, the level of clarity that Kara has provided here is just, it's unmatched. So I know there's been a number of books published over the last few years about this subject. They're okay, some of them, but they're always a little bit iffy. You know, they, they tend to believe in the true trans or they're making kind of arguments that just have nothing to do with feminism at all. And Kara's book is, is the one. So I would, I would just, you, you need to own this book if you're here on this seminar. It will really, really help you. And you can give it to people. That's the best part. It's like, read this book. It could not be clearer. So thank you. Thank so you, Kara. Yeah. 
Thanks, everyone.